Now, um, the release of release of carbon uh, from the uh, the ocean floor in the Arctic. Um, I was just hearing yesterday about a study that uh, human sperm counts are are dropping and raising a question of whether we uh, will continue to be able to continue to reproduce ourselves as a species. Um, there's so many, so many things beginning to come forward that place our very survival in doubt. Now, it's been interesting that many of us have come from a kind of a deep ecology foundation. Um, you know, we can kind of philosophically step back and say, well, we may be finished as a species, but uh, you know, Earth will recover. Um, Earth will go on. It may take a few billion years, um, but you know, this, this is not permanent. Well, this book that Herman Green called to our attention um, points out that that latter part may not be true. That species that mobilize to get rid of uh, invasive species, I mean superorganisms that organize to get rid of invasive species do not always recover themselves. And it may be the case that we humans, by our abuse of Earth, have so disrupted Earth's capacity to recover that in fact Earth's only hope of recovery is to, is if we humans find our true purpose, fundamentally shift our relationship to Earth in ways that we become healers of Earth using our conscious intelligence and agency in a positive way around a fundamentally shifted story of who we are, of the nature of reality, and the nature of our relationships to one another and our living Earth Mother. Um, now, if we look at this within this larger frame of what we're seeing about creation and the uniqueness of this earth and the uniqueness of our species, uh, it begins to suggest a deeply profound human purpose and meaning uh, that, you know, that depends on this deep shift in understanding that in turn gives ever deeper meaning and purpose to, um, to the work of the philosophers of living systems. Now what all this means I'm not entirely sure. I, I hope we can get into some of this in the discussion. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. But bef the, the last thing I want to do since I'm of course best known for thinking about the our institutional and economic systems, uh, you know, some of the implications, the depth of the change that uh, is necessary in our, our, our kind of intellectual institutions uh, and our governing institutions. Uh, so let's take, let's take the field of economics as a discipline. It has to shift from a focus on maximizing financial returns to financial capital to guiding us and maximizing living returns to living capital. Uh, a whole concept that I was basically introduced to by John Cobb, who was also there among you, and his work with him and Herman Daly on ecological economics. There's a fundamentally, uh, a fundamental contrast in the whole thing about economics. We come to the whole institution of law, and the need, well, the recognition that our, our current, current legal system gives more rights to corporations than to people, and it gives no rights to nature. Wow. It's pretty obvious as we take this deeper frame that without nature there are no people, and without people there are no corporations. This flips the whole concept of our legal system on its head. The rights of Earth, the rights of nature, have to come first. The integrity of Earth 
is absolutely essential to our very existence. Corporations are creations of, of humans. The only reason for us to create a corporation through our government is to serve a public purpose. That fundamentally shifts our whole understanding of the nature of, of the corporation and in turn the whole nature of the system by which we organize our governments. We get to science. Science has broken itself down into countless isolated disciplines, each of which is divorced from this deeper understanding of uh, the living earth, or what you might call the Whiteheadian uh, philosophy. They each need to become grounded, but they also need to recognize that the, the most meaningful knowledge is the knowledge of relationships, the connections, the, the, the reconnecting of the knowledge of our understanding of uh, the various academic disciplines. Uh, this has, so this has deep implications for science. It also has deep implications for education and how we organize education. And do we organize it around uh, teaching students to memorize data that they can now look up on quickly on Google? Or do we focus our education on training our students to pursue questions, deep questions of understanding? Uh, to understand systems and the design of systems, to recognize the difference between a living metaphor and a mechanistic metaphor so that they can become citizens of a, a, a living earth unfolding toward uh, ever greater creative possibility. It brings us into the deepest issues of, of religion and recognizing that within the deeper unfolding philosophies, uh, we begin to see the connection between science and religion in a very different way, and the role of religion in helping us understand these new philosophical perspectives within an ethical framework. Uh, we have to rethink our whole frame of an understanding of, of human security. Uh, when we think about our excessive demand on Earth's living systems, there's probably no part of that system that is ultimately more destructive than war and the instruments of war and their implementation. Uh, we basically uh, eliminating war and the instruments of, of war uh, becomes essential to our future. So, some of the most interesting discussions I've had recently with my colleagues center on the question of is there, is there any hope for the human future? Is it possible to avoid the ultimate collapse of Earth's living systems? And if those systems collapse, are there likely to be any humans left in the end? Or are we on our way to becoming an extinct species? Or will we, in our struggle for survival as a dysfunctional species, simply go down further, uh, destroying whatever remains of Earth's capacity to support life? These are the truly deep questions of our time that must be at the forefront of our discussion, um, and that we all, I believe, have an important uh, responsibility to bring into the public conversation, but hopefully doing it in a way that creates a sense of hope and possibility that not only might we be able to present, prevent our own extinction, but to do it in a way that allows us to emerge as the creative species of our potential, so that we become true contributors to not only the health and well-being of the earth that birthed and sustains us, but as well to the continuation of creation's journey of self-discovery and self-knowing toward ever greater complexity, beauty, awareness, and possibility. But it requires making full use of the deepest level of the advances in human understanding in the past 50 years. It is a role for process philosophers, but I would suggest with an update and attention, an update in the concepts 
as science is bringing them forth and a deeper attention to the application, the implications of application to how we think and act and organize institutionally as a species. So with that, I want to turn it back over to you and open it up for wherever you'd like to take the discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Who would like to be the first, ask the first question? Is there somebody, there's somebody with a speaker there. Well, I didn't have any thoughts or questions. David, this is Herman. So thank you so much for that talk. I think you probably have never given that talk before. Is that true? That is true. Yeah, and you have arrived at the wisdom age at the appropriate time. And you have a new role now beyond the one that you've played for so many years. And so it's an important thing that you've done. And also I would say that your interpretation of Clive Hamilton's book was in a way more profound than mine. And I think it's an excellent understanding. I just wanted to congratulate you on your talk. And again, for the people in the process community to realize that ecological civilization understood broadly is our calling. And I would report back to David that you would be very pleased with the conversations and talks that have been held at this conference. So mine is really a comment and not a question. Thank you for that. And it is true, I have never given this presentation before. And in the very process of preparing for engaging in this conversation with a rather like-minded IONS colleague. And then this gathering has pushed my own thinking to a depth far beyond anything I've considered before. And I thank you for your invitation because if you hadn't invited me, I wouldn't have given this presentation and it would not have pushed this advance of my own thinking. I'm not hearing anybody. Tim Eastman from Washington, D.C. area. I've been a plasma physicist in my career and now doing more in philosophy and participating in this meeting for my philosophical interest and being inspired and enjoying the intersection of so many fields. And as you, in your call for putting together a new vision, I think this community is especially one that's right for responding to that call to some, forwarding to some new narrative or new storyline. Of course, there's other communities that are important for this. I think the biosemiotics community is one and the philosophy of biology, clearly. The areas of economics that you're involved with, various scientific communities. I think many scientific colleagues that I know would be supportive of this kind of approach. And yet, it's, as always, a mixed bag. You have some that continue to hold to outdated metaphysical notions, holding on to either dualism or substance thought. And part of it is identifying those stakeholders that can be most effective to take, identify a new narrative, but then to forward it more broadly to the broader public. Our limited philosophy group here has rather limited resources and audience. So I ask you, what suggestions do you have for pulling together stakeholders that have the capability to articulate the message and to get it more effectively carried out around the world? Wow, that's a very challenging question. You 
know, it takes me to one of the things that I think it was, it was just an insight that, uh, that sort of hit me late last night while I was preparing. Um, I have found myself resistant, well not resistant, but uh, kind of puzzled by the, uh, the framework of, of white Gideon uh, philosophers. And I want to say this in a way that is, is fully, just fully respectful. Um, but I guess it's, it's, I've sometimes referred to, you know, I don't find it very helpful to, to focus on the ideas of dead philosophers. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned this to, uh, um, uh, to, to Maria Teresa um, on a conversation. She said, well, you know, White is not really a dead philosopher, it continues. But I realize what it is, is if as scholars we put our focus on an individual, and the ideas of an individual, uh, we get locked in place. And in this instance, uh, you know, the truth is Whitehead is, is, a, is a living being, is, is dead, and his ideas, his deep insights were formed before he had the benefit of most of the extraordinary advances in knowledge that we have now that actually confirmed his basic frame, but allow us to take it much deeper, uh, with much more sophistication and a much deeper sense of the, of the practical implications for what, how we move forward as a species. So it occurred to me that simply the reframing of the, in a sense, the purpose of this group, that instead of framing ourselves as a group of Whiteheadian philosophers, we frame ourselves as philosophers of living systems. That then creates a more open frame within which to bring the ideas of, uh, of, of many of our deepest thinkers integrating them with the frontiers of scientific knowledge of our experience and you know the way i think about the the new enlightenment that it's actually bringing together integrating insights of traditional people traditional wisdom uh the sight insights of our great spiritual teachers over time um the insights of the various religions and now the uh the lessons of the, of the frontiers of science and both advances scientifically of our understanding of consciousness but also of matter uh, and the mechanisms of matter and, and how those come together. Now, once we put this into a living system philosophy frame, this then allows us potentially to talk to the, to, to the broader public. And, and here I'll be very honest that one of the things that's baffled me uh, is I've you know, gotten very closely involved with uh, a, a number of you who uh, style yourselves as, uh, uh, as process theologists or Whiteheadian philosophers. Um, you know, the language and the presentation is such that I usually go away baffled. Um, you know, some of you tell you tell me, well, your your philosophy is really the same as uh, Whiteheadian philosophy, but I, I have a very hard time grasping what the connection is, just because of the the kind of specialized language. And if we want to talk to the public and make our ideas relevant to the public. We need to find ways to express these really profound ideas in ways that communicate easily with ordinary people. I'm also struck, you know, <laughs> um, you know, my wife and I both hold uh, degrees of doctors of philosophy, and yet, you know, it's only been very recently uh, in in these discussions in the last few weeks that I've really gotten into this, you know, the depth of what I've uh, have been trying to articulate in this particular presentation. Uh, 
you know, in terms of the depth of the, of the issues of our philosophical epistemological frames. Uh, you know, one level, I've been into this for a long time, I had no clue of these, uh, th these deep issues at the time that I actually received my Doctor of Philosophy degree and had absolutely no idea what philosophy meant. Um, now I'm coming to a deeper understanding of that, but um, I think we have to recognize that our role as the philosophers is to integrate these elements together, um, you know, to take, take the, the findings of science and translate them into ethical frameworks and frames of, uh, of application that then have relevance to, uh, to religion and to policy. And recognizing it is basically the role of the, role of the philosopher to connect all of these elements, um, and it is an absolutely essential and very, very profound role. Uh, but we also have to learn to do it in, 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 in a language that ordinary people uh, can understand. <clears throat> Even you know, people like me who have a doctorate in philosophy but don't know what philosophy means. <coughs> Um, it's a very interesting question. Other, yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Sinan from Stiefel from Munich, Germany. Um, I would like to connect to the previous question, but uh, push it a little bit further towards uh, your field of expertise, living systems. And uh, um, maybe it's due to the rather lazy nature of human beings. I'm not sure, maybe I'm going to sit down because of the noise. Um, Maybe it's because of, uh, um, I'm lazy, but also because the situation is rather urgent. And my question is, uh, in a living system, is there a general, um, how do I start? I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. <laughs> I have made the ex experience that um, people, corporations, institutions, are rather resilient to new ideas and they tend to go back uh, to their old ideas, especially when they're as catchy as making money is better than making no money or uh, GDP growth is just a really catchy indicator of that's better than and this, this is worse. So uh, it's really difficult to persuade um, these uh, living systems uh, into a more complex a more um, and not as controllable, not as uh, predictable uh, way of living, and a more creative way of planning, a more uh, uh, something that needs more intuition, more open-mindedness, and uh, therefore doesn't offer that as much security and as much hard facts. So uh, my experience is that living systems, uh, on every level, have this resilience against more wholesome. Um, developments and as an expert I would like to ask you uh, is there any shortcut any weak point in a living system how we may lure uh, ourselves as living systems and other people or other institutions into a more wholesome uh, way of thinking and living I mean, there's no question the systems the systems in place and the ways of thinking in place are very resistant to change um, you know, corporations themselves, well, we could get into that, but uh, one of the things I've realized is that most corporations are running on autopilot. They're, um, they're, 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 they're better understood as robots than as uh, human systems. Uh, that they're, they're, they're purely artificial creations. Now, the key, of, the, the key idea to unlock our understanding is simply advancing a recognition of what money is. You know, it, it is breathtakingly simple. Money is nothing but a number. It has absolutely no existence outside of the human mind. There is no equivalent in, in nature, no equivalent in the living system. And yet, you know, we have become, we have so deceived ourselves 
um, you know, by essentially a, a morally and intellectually bankrupt economics, which we can go into that whole thing, but that, that's a, that's a whole, whole other inquiry. Um, and they, uh, it's just the simple idea. This is the thing that you know. It always it always strikes me that you know people get this instantly. Almost everybody ever explain this to them, they just nod their head and say, well, yeah, of course. It's, it's, it's as obvious as it can be that to destroy living systems, which are the foundation of our existence, to make money, which is nothing but a number on a computer hard drive, is the ultimate suicidal insanity. And it is absolutely stupid. Now, trying, you know, getting into the issue of <clears throat> How could we, a supposedly intelligent species, <clears throat> become so drawn into, um, into a belief system that puts our very existence at risk, and yet is so fundamentally, clearly, obviously fallacious at the simplest level? Um, I don't know, I may have to turn this back to you folks to figure out, but um, you know, part of it is just is, is in a way recognizing how simple and obvious these ideas are and finding the clearest, simplest ways to, uh, to express them and standing up to the economists and saying, you know, this, this, is, this is bullshit. It is totally beyond worth of, of any kind of academic respectability. I mean, the teaching of conventional economics should be banned from the university. It, it, you know, it's the equivalent of teaching some kind of witchcraft or something that, uh, that, that has no, no foundation in, uh, um, in any kind of ethical or, um, or, or scientific reality. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's really disturbing the idea that we could, we could seal our own fate, our own extinction, simply by our failure to recognize that real wealth is living wealth, financial wealth is nothing but a number. It's that simple. And I'm just going to add one sentence to this, uh, um, because we were talking about simple ways of bringing it across. And there's a very uh, beautiful way of phrasing this by Adam Watts. He said, um, he said um, that uh, money is basically a, a measurement, like uh, centimeters or inches. And uh, the situation is this, you have a constru construction site and there are people who would build the house and there are the materials uh, who they would use and, uh, and there's the place where they could build the house and there's the architect who has the plan but then, uh, but then the project manager comes and says, I'm sorry, we cannot build the house because we ran out of centimeters. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, this, you know, I mean, this, gets, this actually gets to a part of the reality. Uh, as an individual, in our current system, we absolutely depend on money. Because the system has consolidated ownership and control of our means of living in the hands of, you know, 8, 10, 20 people and these massive global corporations. And if we don't have the money that they control our access to, we literally can't live. But it's all an artifact of this system. It's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with our, our fundamental reality. Uh, but because we become so dependent on money, it, it does become very natural for us in day-to-day -day life to simply accept the idea that, that money is wealth and we have to do whatever we need to do to get money. Um, and you know, economists themselves actually, this is an example of what they call a fallacy of composition. Uh, you know, what, what is true for the individual is not necessarily the same as what's true for the society. Now, your example of the construction project is, in a sense, very real. I mean, if you are doing a construction project and you don't have money, then you cannot get access to the 
fundamental materials and so forth that you require to construct your home. But you take this at a societal level. So you take a society that has unemployed people, it has underutilized land, it has all the other essential requirements, and yet you know, we're then told that we can't meet people's needs because we can't afford it. We do not have the money to put these things together in a way that meets our needs. Now that is the insanity because while an individual we can't create money from nothing, as a society all we have to do is create a central bank and with that computer you can instantly create as much money as you want or as you need. Uh, and it's a, it's a very interesting piece of our language. You know, we get confused with our language, the, the term wealth. We equate money, land, life, all these things we consider wealth, but it includes, you know, we include money in our definition of wealth, so we treat it as equivalent. And it's not. The, the money is a number. Now, where this becomes really clear is in our definitions of capital. You know, we, we, we have natural capital, human capital, intellectual capital, all of these are real capital. But then as soon as we call money capital, we can accept the idea that money is a constraint, whereas the money should not be a constraint because it's just a number that can be created in any quantity that is uh, necessary and appropriate to put these other forms of real capital together in a way that meet our economy. It's, it's just one of the ways we get caught up in the, uh, uh, the deficiencies of our language. And again, economists are, bear a major responsibility for that, uh, that confusion. And again, I want to I wanna thank um, John Cobb because it really was John's contributions to ecological economics and his, uh, uh, his collaboration with Herman Daly that I think provided many of the breakthroughs that are absolutely fundamental to my understanding of uh, the real nature of economics. Um, can I ask you a question? Is there, um, sure. If you look at the origins of money in um, many of Western Europe, um, Charlemagne paid his troops in pfennigs or whatever they call, you know, spits of silver, um, and people didn't want them, so he had to flog people to accept them. What that really shows is that behind money, there's force. You know, it's imposed. It's imposed by the people who've got power. I mean, they use that to mystify what's going on. They follow them what goes on. Hold on, the people who've got power. And as you, Chris, you, you work with uh, Perkins, talking about the corporatocracy, these are the people with power. Now, one of the advantages you've got over you know, Marx and the like is that you've actually worked with these members of the corporatocracy. Um, and it seems to me that they've got so much power that the only hope is that there'll be divisions between them that not just can be exploited. Have you got any ideas of which people could you know, be turned to you know, face up to the fact that they're destroying the global ecosystem? You know, this, this is not acceptable. I mean, I know, I, I think what their views are is they're social Darwinists. Uh, Lovelock says that only 20% of the population will be alive at the end of the century. And they just accept that. You know, this is. Uh, Laws, you know, natural law, sorting itself out, getting rid of the weaker members of the species, creating destruction. Now, I think that a lot of members of the corporatocracy won't be able to stomach that. Can they be organised to close what's going on? Okay, you know, brought in uh, a number of uh, very foundational concepts. Uh, let me start with the first one. The um, and then this is one of the things that I came to recognized through the, uh, my experience in international development. Before we came in and introduced development, uh, you know, most people lived directly off the land. Um, and you know, through, their, through their exchange, uh, they, they met their needs for housing, for food, water, etc. Uh, between the community and the land. And they, they did it, for the most part, without without money. Um, now, by the 
dichotomous definition, they were absolutely poor because they had no money. Uh, but they had food, they had housing, they had a community. Um, I believe you had a, uh, a presentation by my good friend and colleague, Norman Norbert Hodge, uh, who, whose work has been foundational for, for work around the dock, foundational to uh, my really grasping this. Uh, you know, many, many people in a traditional society had very good lives with no money. Now, to get control of these people, for corporations to get control, they had to make these people dependent on money. And in fact, much of what we call development has been a process of driving people off their lands, destroying their capacity to create their own means of living and making, depend, making them dependent on providing their labor to a corporation or corporatists or bankers uh, on whatever terms the bankers would uh, accept in order then to get the means of living that they previously created for themselves. So that, that's part of understanding the absolute corruption of the system and the perversion of GDP because GDP only measures the, uh, the financial exchanges. So if you're creating your own living, uh, you're contributing nothing to GDP, even though you may be living well, as this element plays out. Now, in terms of the change and getting attention of members of the corporatocracy, uh, here, here's one of the, the, one of the major barriers. There are CEOs, there are heads of corporations that understand uh, this issue. I don't know how many of you know Jim Wallace, who was a uh, a leader of the progressive wing of the uh, uh, of, of the uh, um, evangelical uh, Christian. Uh, those that you know, know Jim uh, know he would be very comfortable and a very good contributor to exactly the conversation we're having. Um, Jim has talked to me about his experience with the World Economic Forum, which is a meeting of the corporate CEOs of the, the, the leading corporates, and how he will get a knock on his door late at night from some of these chief corporate executives uh, wanting, wanting to do essentially a confessional session, that they realize that the work that they are doing is destroying um, destroying the species, destroying Earth. They are also aware that if they acted on their values to try to counter this, they would be instantly expelled from the corporation. They would be instantly fired. Because that is the way the system is geared. Um, you know, even if they control their own corporation, if it's publicly traded, it would be bought out by uh, by a, 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 a hedge fund or a private equity fund, and, uh, and, and they would be just, they'd be fired. Uh, now, uh, you know, I harbor the possibility that if we could get enough corporate executives to, and, and bankers, uh, to this level of awareness, and they conspired together to uh, uh, dismantle the system, it might be a possibility. But we also have to recognize that many of these people in these key positions are not capable of a moral compass. Uh, they are certifiable psychopaths or sociopaths. Uh, they bear a lot in common with uh, our, uh, our current president. Uh, and th there is no hope of them even trying to counter which means that the ultimate force for change really has to come from we the people, from people acting outside of these existing systems, these existing institutional systems. Um, now that doesn't give us a huge basis for hope. It does give us a possibility. And it's why our, our attention needs to be focused not on trying to convince the banksters that they need to heal their heathen ways. It means that we have to
to focus our primary attention on education of we the people, recognizing ultimately that the only power, well, let me, let me tell you another story because this is, this is absolutely foundational to understand. Um, back in 1992, I participated in a, uh, a seven day, a 10 day retreat that we organized in um, Baguio, Philippines, with roughly 10 leaders of major uh, Asian NGOs. And it was just an open reflection on the Asian development experience. And it was a time when people were talking about the Asian development of miracle. But those of us who were gathered there recognized that the reality of development in Asia was one of environmental destruction and increasing inequality and exclusion of more and more people from their access to a means of living, an adequate means of living. And as we talked, I began to get this image. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the horror movie, The Blob. The very, uh, the very kind of simplistic, but there's this, this kind of mass of hemoglobin that just goes out over the, the countryside and it absorbs people and animals uh, and absorbs them into, the, into itself. And it suddenly hit me, the image of money reaching out across the, the landscape in the name of development and consuming people and animals and life everywhere in touch unto this undifferentiated mass. And it seems so true to the reality that I was, I was just captivated by this. But then it, it, it struck me how, I mean, it's like life, or like money has a motive power to destroy life. And it has a, a desire to destroy life. How could that possibly be? And that's what I you know, really began to hit me. Money is nothing but a number. How could a number have this kind of motive power? And that's when I recognized the only energy, the only motive power that money has is our human life energy misdirected from the support and flow of life to the development and flow and creation of money, which again is nothing but numbers on a computer hard drive. Now, you know, that, that is where we begin to recognize our true agency and our true power within this system. That the corporations and the banksters can only, their power depends on our acquiescence and are directing our life energy to them. And, you know, this is where I find hope in, you know, the young people and the various initiatives to rebuild community. Um, young people going back to the land to grow their own food. The popularity of farmers' markets and community-supported agriculture. Uh, the effort to restore uh, cooperative banks and, and local businesses. Uh, these initiatives are extremely <coughs> difficult to make work, and yet there are more and more people mobilized around them. And as we do that, what we're doing is, is withholding our life energy from the banksters and the corporations and redirecting it to the building of living communities. Uh, and that, to me, is, is foundational to our kind of theory of change and our uh, sense of, uh, of where we need to be focusing our, our life energy as human beings. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, push this a little fur further. I'm Carolyn Brown from Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and if by some magic, um, overnight, a large body of people saw the vision that you lay out, you just lay out, including the pointlessness and emptiness of money. Um, the challenge is getting from where we are 
to that vision. Um, and I sat with a group of economists who had these values, um, were trying to envision what that would be without damaging the weakest people in the society, um, our society and societies around the world. Because um, we could consume less, but who would lose their jobs? So the question relates to, you've answered it partly in terms of withdrawing our participation in certain ways, but to bring it to scale somehow, what, how do we get from, even conceptually, forget about power, conceptually, from where we are to some version of this vision that you've laid out? Well, I think you, I think you really, in a way, hit the nail on the head. Um, it has to begin conceptually. If we don't, if we don't have a conceptual understanding of the nature of the problem and some vision of the, of the possibility, uh, we can't get there. And you know, this is potentially where your work as philosophers and academics come in. Um, we need to be using our think power and our communication power to articulate these very basic ideas in the absolute simplest, clearest ways possible. And you know, get them out through our classes, through our conferences, um, through our blogs, um, through every communication mechanism we have. Um, you know, and withdrawing intellectual legitimacy from the old frames, the, the, the defunct frames, as, as Whitehead and others have been trying to do. Now, here again is one of the you know, extraordinary advances in our human situation that, uh, you know, I, from what I can tell of the ages of the people in the room, uh, most of you have lived through this as I have. Um, you know, when, when my wife and I were living and working in Ethiopia in the 1960s, our only mode of communication back in the United States was snail mail that took, you know, took two weeks in each direction. Now, you know, that was characteristic of the state of humanity and the limitations of our ability to think, communicate, and act as a species. Uh, and that, that barrier was a great benefit to the institutions of empire because it keeps the people separated. Now, we of course just, you know, by what we're experiencing right here by this use of Skype, that we can pretty much now, any of us, connect with any other human being on the planet effortlessly and costlessly. Um, and this gives us a capacity for communication that we've never had before, and it is a capacity that we absolutely have to be using now as efficiently as we can to, to do just exactly what's happening uh, in, in this room at this time, is recognizing the commonality of our really most foundational beliefs and understanding. Uh, and then engaging in conversation on exactly what does this mean. So, you know, it's, uh, instead of trying to, in a sense, refine, make more sophisticated, more esoteric in a way, uh, our deep understanding, we have to bring it down to the absolute essentials. Um, and we have to communicate it more, you know, it's, so much of it is just, it's just a matter of our connecting. Well, of course, we, we've got this whole thing in Western culture of the focus on the individual. And, you know, this is where also our understanding, our recognition that, uh, you know, reality is relationships. <laughs> you know, this very interesting idea that, that matter itself is, in the deepest sense, not, not real, only relationships are real. Uh, but it's, you know, this instance, it's a recognition that, that we, we survive and exist as a species as a living uh, earth organism only through our connections. And again, the, the story frames and 
combined with our capacity for communication. I'm sorry, I can just connect really good to this thought. I think you have to do the transformation from the side of the divine feminine, and that's the same core if you understand it in, in a feminine matter. It's core, it's the core of the earth. There is the network, we have the network, a network of networks, and there are the, the feminine, if the, if the women would establish women circles, they could just help the planet to, um, to, to the shift, to make a kind of transformation out of the problem. That's one idea. I live in Switzerland and we, we have the Venus house and we have women circles and red tent temple. And we have a free time market. So we have just a network of people who you can offer your time and you can just um, change values to values. And you have more than 200 options to, to get something from it. And they just uh, said to us that we are not allowed to grow so much. Because if we would grow with that network, you know, you are just making some kind of legalization of black, um, how is it called? Black kind of working, because we don't pay taxes and we are just black out black. of the, the world of the money. But I think it has to happen from the side of the divine feminine. And that's my idea. Yeah, th thanks, but that, that may have to be the last question because we're running out of time. So. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else could respond to that. I, I, I could not hear and follow. There was too much echo. So I, I must admit, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> That's a last <large> question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone else understands, um, yeah, just, uh, I, 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 I need just to pick the well. just to, it's, it's I don't better. know the sound system was not working properly. Is it better now for you? No. Is it better now for you to hear? I can barely follow. So it would be just a possibility to build a network and the network of network of sharing. So you can get out of that world of the money. But this sharing you know, sharing of the time or sharing of values, it can come from the quality of the women. So I see it like, uh, like the space of the sacred feminine, which we are just opening. It's an intuition. It's, uh, we have a red tent temple movement, and we have more and more circles of that feminine energy. And I just wanted to add it here. I, um, if I hear correctly, I was, you know, you're talking about the importance of sharing, and uh, it, you know, sharing is absolutely essential to uh, to our future. That we have only the the generative capacity, the the life support capacity of of one Earth. Uh, we have allowed our human numbers to grow to such a size that uh, we simply, there is no way to support all people at the level of the extravagant lifestyle that uh, many of us have come to believe is uh, our due, uh, where the few of us have come to believe is our due. Uh, and one way of framing it is that our future going forward needs to be, we need to attempt to assure the um, the, the physical necessities of material sufficiency for everyone and combined with spiritual abundance. And this is where the concepts of happiness that uh, Helen and Robert Hodge focuses on uh, become so essential. And this is part of understanding what are our sources of real human satisfaction and, uh, and happiness. Uh, which of course are relationships and uh, a creative expression and a sense of being a contributing member of the community, uh, the thrill of, of, of learning and exploration. That's the spiritual of 
departments, which we can all have and enjoy um, as the absolute foundations of our life. But we absolutely have to share, learn to share the material sufficiency, and that gets into, uh, uh, well, we, we run into huge issues of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of property rights and the rethinking of property rights. And, you know, I sometimes say, well, if, if private property is a really good thing, then everybody should have some. <laughs> and it should be related to having a, uh, an ownership stake in uh, the means of uh, our, our the, main, the essential means of our living. Sure. Anyway, I, I hope that is somewhat responsive to your, to your question. Okay. Anyhow, thank you to all of you. It's been a, uh, it's been a wonderful, delightful experience for me to, uh, uh, to interact with you and your invitation has been a great gift to me as it has pushed me into some of these deeper questions and I hope we find ways to continue the conversation.